Okay, we roll. Go ahead. This is October 27th, 2015. This is Lessons of the 60s. Today, we're interviewing Julie Barnett, who grew up in Washington, D.C. Our videographer is Eddie Becker. The interviewer is Ann Gallivan. And let's start off by asking you, <coughs> Julie, what were you doing in Washington, D.C. between 1960 and 1975? Well, I moved here with my family that year. And uh, we lived for a year in Maryland, and so I think we, that year, in the course of that year, we moved to D.C. <coughs> that year being 1960. Yes, the year being 1960, and so I went to the local public school for a couple years, fourth through sixth grade, and then afterwards I went to Sidwell Friends School for until, and graduated in 1972. And so then, from that time on, I was no longer in D.C., I lived in Mexico. I Actually, I went to the University of Wisconsin for one semester mm -hmm. and then took off for Mexico. Well, we'll talk about your schools in Washington, D.C., but let's back up a little bit first and talk about your, your early childhood. Um, your father, Richard Barnett, was a founder of Institute for Policy Studies. Mm -hmm. So that uh, means that you grew up in pretty socially conscious household, what do you remember about those years in the early 60s? What do you know? Who, who visited your house? What kind of people did you meet because of who your father was? Well, a lot of, a lot of people who were involved in the civil rights movement and in the anti-war movement. A lot of people came be, and stayed with us during demonstrations. That was all the way um, through. It's, that became much more so um, as you know, in junior high and high school. I mean, the institute was started in 1963. So when when I first came, we came. We we uh, they my my dad worked at the State Department in the disarmament agency, and actually my, the first memory I have, a political memory you could say, was uh, he wrote this book called Who Wants Disarmament, and the answer was nobody. Uh, certainly nobody in the government, because, and he became very frustrated. And I, I actually, I made, I was a very arty person from way back, and I made a little uh, china um, uh, pot, and I somehow put an impression, impression of the cover of that book on it, or drew a picture, uh, and it said, it had the name and so on, and then it said, Daddy's Book. And so, um, that uh, and then he, I remember lots of meetings and with Mark Raskin and other people in our living room uh, when they were talking about founding the institute, and uh, because that went on for a year or so before it actually got started, and then there was this, um, the first building was on Florida Avenue, and there was it was kind of I remember it'd be kind of dark and drafty, but it was fun place because we would go, there would be community dinners, we called them munity dinners, and we would run around and uh, with other kids and kids of the other people who, who were part of that uh, original group, and we would run around there, and, and so that to me was the most fun part of the Institute. It didn't even last that long because they stopped doing it, but, uh, but that, that I felt that, uh, you know, we were, we were welcome and we really participated. Do you remember any of the names of the people who were at those dinners or their children? Who oh, well, yeah, it well, would have been Erica Raskin and uh, Jamie Raskin and, uh, no, well, Noah was younger and I remember he was very sick for a long time and that was a lot of worry for Mark and his wife, Barbara, at the time. And uh, then there were other, other other kids. Uh, and other and leaders. Right? Oh, right. well, yes, yes, there was the other. Well, let's see, Arthur Waskow, um, Ralph Stavens. Now, I don't know if these were all at the same time. It was, it's a bit of a jumble. Yes. Um, I remember that uh, there was, uh, I think it was Ralph Stavens, that had this machine, brought this machine to our house to try to uh, detect wiretapping by the FBI. 
it was a sort of machine like a Geiger counter, and I, you know, I have no idea if, if it worked or if what he detected, but I definitely remember that being an interesting thing. And there was a f uh, also a few people from uh, a different, I mean, a lot, over the years, a lot of different people. The m one of the most noteworthy was Michael Manley came to dinner once. Yes, president uh, of Jamaica. The president of Jamaica. And uh, also uh, I.F. Stone, Izzy Stone, came a number of times. Daniel Ellsberg and different people like that. Um, although the, the most famous people that, that were connected with the Institute, I, don't, I didn't get a chance to meet, all, meet them, although I did have, uh, uh, I did get some good, uh, good secondhand uh, fallout from them. That, that was uh, uh, Paul Newman and John Lennon. <coughs> you, you, you. I didn't meet them, but my dad did, because uh, he, uh, Paul Newman, I guess he was a donor. They were trying to cultivate him into donor. I don't know if he ever did. Um, maybe he did, because I mean, he was a progressive person, him and, uh, and uh, uh, Robert Redford. Um, but uh, he took my dad for a ride in his sports car, which was a very harrowing experience for my father, although he was quite a, a, he was a not, he was, it was harrowing for us to drive with my dad, so it was a little bit of, uh, <laughs> of uh, retribution or something there. Um, but, uh, so, but that was, so I got to brag about that. And then he also helped John Lennon when he had he had the, the um, uh, conviction for for marijuana. That was uh, and uh, I don't know. There was some immigration, some problem, and I don't know if he actually helped him. But uh, but you know he was sort of in the mix. And so so that was uh, those were some. Now you came in the in 1960s. Mm -hmm. So in those years. Washington, D.C. was still a pretty buttoned downtown, a kind of conservative. Can you talk about going to public school when you were six years old or seven years old? Yeah, well, <clears throat> yeah, it was, we were just in, we moved into the neighborhood where we lived, which, uh, or the neighborhood, which is now, it's called, it's nicknamed the Gold Coast. Uh, I guess it's Shepherd Park. Uh, in upper upper northwest uh, on uh, near 16th street near it sober was spring known then as the gold coast because it was the where the wealthier african americans lived up, up, that's up right well they were they yeah well, when we moved in they were moving in and white people mostly jews who had lived there were moving out so the jews uh, so it was it was a real showcase for for how how neighborhood change worked uh, because you know the Jews had been able to live there, they not able to you know over on the other side of the park at Bethesda and Chevy Chase were much much more restricted, and so um, but on this side of the park they were able to uh, so the Jews lived there and then and then wealthy blacks because it's a very the very nice houses, and but the school where I go uh, where I went to public school Shepherd School was uh, kind of on the line between uh, this. This these very nice houses, nice 14th Street, 16th Street. But on the other side of 14th Street, the houses were much, much poorer and smaller, and there was a lot of uh, African Americans and a lot of white working class kids uh, went there too. So those those children went to the school because there weren't a lot of white kids. There were a lot of uh, there there were well no there was a, it was probably close to half and half at that time. Um, well, so Shepherd Park really represented the neighborhood and the change. Yeah. You'd said that the students there were African American, sort of well off, mm -hmm. uh, working class whites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mostly. Some Jewish kids. Yes, yeah, so yes, kind of le leftover. In our case, we moved in when most of the when when most of the Jews were moving out, but we got a really good deal on the house because the the former owner had uh, had a heart attack and it, and the house is up about 30 steps with no driveway so he couldn't do it anymore so got they got a really good uh, it, yeah it cost thirty nine thousand dollars I remember that it's a big house that it cost thirty nine thousand dollars 
at that time. Well, the school that you went, Shepherd School, um, mm -hmm. did you um, experience any, any racism or pre prejudice from any one of the one groups toward mm -hmm. the others? Uh, yeah. Um, the the white working class kids and the black kids, um, some of whom were, were I mean, the, the African American was a mix of the wealthy um, children who, of professionals, dentists and doctors and so on, who lived on our side of 14th Street. And then there were much more working class on the other side. Um, and uh, but and there was there were definitely clashes and and as is tends to be the case with working class whites they were more overt in their racism I mean I remember one a good friend of mine Amy uh, Amy Piorco um, not to call her out I'm sure she is uh, she is th thinks knows better now but uh, but she called another friend of mine a nigger right in front of the school and um, you know they were fighting and that was something that she could it was clearly that she kind of pulled that out she had that as a weapon uh, that that she knew how she didn't really know what that was but she knew that was something that as a white person she could call a black person in the middle of an argument that maybe she didn't otherwise know how to how to pursue so yeah and uh, the teachers were mostly white if not all white, and I know that uh, they, def it was the school was tracked. There was the white class, basically the white class with a few black kids, I guess, um, the smart, smartest ones, and then there was the then there was the B class. I think that was maybe A and B. They didn't call it. We call it the smart kids and the dumb kids, because um, we knew it, that's that's how they were really thought of. Um, but and, and it was like the, the negative of it. I mean, it was almost all black kids except for a few white kids who were who were like behavior problems, and that's why they were there in that class. Or in my case, we came a little, we came kind of late to the school year, a few weeks late, and so they stuck me in this in the black class or the dumb class. But then the teacher, um, very very early on. We were doing a handwriting lesson, and I had happened to have, I'd been, come from Montgomery County, and so I'd had this lesson. I'd learned cursive letters the year before in third grade, and so when we did it, so I already knew how to write the cursive D, right, the, and I really enjoyed it because of the flowing of the letters I remember very well, and so she had me go up to the board and write a cursive D on the board and then she said look at this little girl from Maryland she's just she's come in late and everything and look how she can do this so well and you all can't you know she was really using me the white kid to, to you know to shame beat up on to shame the other shame the, 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 the black kids yeah and then very soon after that uh, I was transferred to the smart class or the white class and uh, yeah but I realized I didn't understand all of the what was going on but I knew it was uh, you know I felt terrible I knew they felt bad and I felt bad you know and that the teacher this was you know I knew that this was not a good thing that was going on here with what the teacher was doing Mrs. Coiner well now you said that you you didn't care much for school because you were kind of an arty moody kid so mm -hmm. um, how did how did all this affect you I mean did you have did you get depressed about it or you just didn't understand it no well I know I noticed everything and I thought about it um, I mean I read books uh, the mostly I mostly I read and I did art stuff and I had a few friends in the neighborhood and you know play I don't know I didn't it didn't affect if, I mean, I didn't, I knew I didn't really like, I didn't like school, I didn't like the, the teachers, I didn't really relate to them, I didn't think they understood me, um, they didn't understand the art stuff that I was trying to do, they, they didn't, I mean, like, I, I wrote a poem and they published it in the, in the, in the school newsletter, but they left out some lines, so it didn't rhyme. And so it was like, it's like I feel really, you know, it's like, what did they, they not read it? They didn't, it's almost like they, they, they had such a low opinion that they, 
they didn't think somebody was capable of doing a rhyme or, or something that they, you know, holding, why didn't they say, is there something missing here or, or what's going on here? It's like, it just seemed like they didn't have a, you know, they just weren't. <laughs> one more thing about the school, they had, we had this kind of musical review and one of the teachers wrote it. And I remember that to the, uh, the song, the, the TV program, Car 54, Where Are You? <laughs> Some, you know, silly cop show, right? She wrote a parody and it was kind of like political parody. And it had one line in it that said, Sukarno won't let go. Sukarno, the president, the democratically elected progressive president of Indonesia, it kind of makes me, gives me, ugh, who was very sh shortly with, with US uh, backing overthrown by by Suharto, who was a terrible dictator and, and murdered you know, thousands and thousands of people with, you know, with the, with the, with the, with the complicit, total complicity of the CIA. And so it was like, you know, I can remember, you know, these key art, like us, just blithely singing that song and, and you know, with, repeating the propaganda about how bad Sukarno was, a communist, right? And uh, there was also, there was, uh, I mean, we had air raids and air raid sirens and, you know, had those, those you know, symbols, those yellow and black symbols about a, the atomic bomb uh, in our school. I suppose you probably had a little bit of an advantage being from the family you were from, but understanding who Sukarno was and wasn't. Well, I asked. Yeah, I could ask. Yeah, right. But I didn't, I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I could, like, sit, speak up or say, or I didn't quite have it put together enough so I could say, like, you know, what's, you know, <laughs> what's going on here? And I could say, so I felt very removed, very cut off from the teachers. Now, as the, as the uh, 60s moved on and the Vietnam War started, do you remember going to the early demonstrations or any of the big demonstrations with, with or without your parents? Did you do, do, do all those things? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, just about demonstrations. I know we, um, my parents went to the March on Washington with um, the, uh, the Martin Luther, the, the, you know, the big demonstration. And, uh, but they didn't take, they, they didn't take us, and so we always held that against them. Um, but we did go to a number of, uh, of, of civil rights demonstrations, too. But, um, but especially um, anti-Vietnam War demonstrations, numerous of them. And then, um, I mean, jumping the, uh, you know, f to when I was in high school, going to the, um, like the May Day demonstrations. So my, my brother and sister and I were, and my boyfriend, were all arrested together. You were all um, arrested during May Day? Yeah, yeah, my, 1970, was it 1971? Yeah, when, when they arrested 14,000 people. Were you in the stadium yeah. down there? Uh, yes. Well, no, we were, in, yeah, we were in the practice field, the, the, um, the practice field um, first. Uh, yeah, it was freezing cold, and they had a, a tarpaulin over it, and so we kind of all huddled under the tarpaulin. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite a scene. It was thousands of people. We were just walking down the street looking for the demonstration. And, uh, you know, it had already been all dispersed, and then somebody, then these, this car just swooped down on, they just swooped down on a shop mace at us. And, yeah, hit my little 12-year-old brother. Um, but then, yeah, and we spent a long time there. And then they put everybody in the stadium, um, the Coliseum, the, the Washington Coliseum. I don't know if that even exists anymore. No, but yeah, it was like later on, you know, in 1973 in, in Chile when I, when I, you know, saw and heard about the, col you know, how, the, how everybody was put in the stadium. Of course, they killed them at the, in, in Chile. They didn't, they didn't do that to us. But it was, it was scary because they had the soldiers on the, on the top, uh, you know, ch areas down, you know, with, with their guns on, you know, looking they, down at they us. They held overnight? Yeah, and then they, then my parents, then they took us because we were, because we were underage, they 
remanded us to some youth detention place and then came and and my parents came and got us and then we had to go to trial my uh, I was I uh, that was a that was a a moment of uh, glory at school because I got to tell everybody uh, somebody asked some some schoolmate asked about it I guess I had said something that and uh, he asked me during class and I went on for pretty much the whole class uh, period telling all about it. it was English class and my English teacher was very conservative and he was fuming but he didn't he didn't feel uh, able to stop me so I got to that was one of the few times when I really felt like I sort of you know was kind of were your parents mm -hmm. proud that all three of you got arrested well I don't know I suppose I don't I don't I don't know if they were particularly they were proud about our that we were you no know, had the courage of our convictions and their convictions, uh, so. Well, now, um, by that time, you were about ready to go into high school, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, so what yeah, yeah. High school? Tell us about high school and what that was like for you. Well, that was Sidwell Friends School. Um, Sidwell Friends School, which is one of the, uh, which is a very posh establishment school in the city. Um, I mean, Nixon's daughters had gone there. It's a Quaker school. That's why it was friends, real friends. But it was very unlike, uh, you know, a lot of the. I mean, Quakers are very anti-war and progressive and so on. But this was at this, at least at this time, very conservative. Um, I mean, I'm sure not the most conservative, but but still very very establishment. I mean, lots of very establishment, well-off families, people in the media ambassadors, government people, lots of those kind of people and wealthy people uh, who went there. And so... Um, now why did they suspend you? Oh, <laughs> they, yeah. Uh, I mean, mostly I was very, I was well behaved. I did my homework and everything. I didn't, I didn't like school. I was, I didn't really feel very at home there, but, but, you know, I would, I was, you know, I did all my work and so on. Um, but they had a dress code there, and um, they had, you know, a lot of rules. And the dress code, it was actually before girls couldn't wear pants at all. And then uh, that was relaxed some, and uh, you could wear pants, but not all kinds of pants. And so I came to school in blue jeans, and I was suspended for that. And... Um, Although not everybody was suspended for things, they weren't they weren't across the board, but they uh, you know they they saw that I didn't really care for them very much. So, mm -hmm. um, but they um, so they I so they brought me into the office and gave me a lecture about that about the rules and so on and about and and the, I remember the dean uh, saying. And you, you know why we don't allow blue jeans. And I said, I didn't know. And she got very mad. She, she thought, you know, accused me of being insolent. But I just said, I really don't know. And so she said, and I quote, it, because they are a symbol of the working class and therefore not appropriate to our school. And so that was, that was, uh, an amazing bit of honesty there, although I actually thought that it it was more about the the it being a symbol of the counterculture rebellion and uh, but who knows it, it that could have been the more the the deeper the deeper reason or maybe it was some of both because they were definitely trying to keep out the counterculture um, although they it definitely it crept in it definitely crept in. Well, you, yeah. Your school uh, experiences of being somebody who did okay in school but didn't really like school. Yeah. Uh, I did very well in school, brains wise. It was like some one thing I could do, but uh, you know, I was a national merit scholar. <laughs> but, but you know. But you said that you were always interested because yeah. of that, pretty much uh, in alternative education. That's and right. Your younger siblings have different experience of school. Yeah. Well, my sister and went to a more uh, progressive private school, Green Acres, and then for 
uh, high school. She went to uh, Georgetown Day School, which was also, I mean, there's also pretty, you know, high tone schools, very, you know, private schools, um, but more relaxed, especially Green Acres. Green Acres was really alternative. Um, and then my brother, he was, I mean, he went to Green Acres too, but he had a teach, they, he just had a terrible experience and they, they, they you had a teacher who did not understand him and he was very difficult anyway and my parents ended up creating with some other parents, people from IPS, um, an alternative school called the Forum School. And I was jealous because I, I kept going to my very, very, you know, straight-laced, uh, you know, traditional school, but I was very interested. I read all these books about alternative education, and I did a project in in in, in my senior year was a project about um, alternative education. Actually, my my junior year, I did a paper about which was supposed to be an English paper. It was this paper called the JERP, Junior English Research Paper, and people did things like, like you know, T. S. Eliot and and stuff like that. So I did a paper called, that was called um, Blacks and Women, Cooperation and Conflict Among the Oppressed. <laughs> that, that was the name that my mother suggested, but that was, that, that was, the, um, but that was the, the subject. And I interviewed people in the, in the uh, women, in the, in the African American, in the, in, the, in the black power movement, and in the, um, you know, the women's movement, and read books, and so on. But um, in uh, um, my senior year, I did a independent study on alternative education, and I went and visited the Forum School, which is over at the cathedral. I don't know, on some, I don't know how they, they somehow got some building or some rooms on the, on the cathedral grounds. Um, and I also just studied different kinds of, uh, of schools of alternative education projects and oh yes and I compared them to my school it was comparative study and my school was found I found it wanting they were not really happy they gave me a like a very a very you know pass you know but with they were not happy with it they were not even happy with my with my they weren't happy with my my junior project either uh, I got like a B minus or something like that, and I always got really good grades. So, you know, I'm. So this, even the the schools considered liberal these days were pretty conservative in those days. I mean, it was still old Washington in lots of ways. Oh yeah, I mean, I yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I I don't know if it's any different. I mean, you know, Chelsea Clinton went there, and uh, so it's very mainstream. Yeah. And expensive. Oh, very expensive. Very expensive. So, you know, it was, it was definitely a, a sacrifice to send me there, you know. I, you know, I'm sure I got a good education and from an academic standpoint, so. Well, then, let's uh, wrap this part of the interview up, your, your, your childhood, and, and ask you, then, um, what was, growing up in Washington these years, having the education that you had, the parents that you mm -hmm. had. Um, what did all these experiences add up for you, for your future? What, what, what did you get out of it? What have you done that's been influenced by all these uh, experiences in the 60s? Well, I have to this day, I've kept being very interested in Alternative education, popular education. I went to Mexico. I you could not even. I just relo. I I spent 16 years in Mexico, and I was part of the the popular education movement, which was a which was a national movement with, of schools started and run by students. And so it was a very different kind of a thing. It was a very you know it was a very big popular movement that grew out of the this the um, the student and popular uprising in Mexico. Uh, in 19, of 1968, and it was the the thing that most kept going, and so I was part of that for a long time. And the anthropology of Mexico, basically. and I went to the School of Anthropology, and uh, got a very different view of of anthropology. Now it was a very it was it was a it was a 
public. It was like the state school of anthropology. It was located for a long time in the Anthropology Museum. It's a worldwide, world-renowned museum, museum of anthropology. And, and, uh, but it was very, it was just because of the time, it was, it was a, it, it took a completely anti-colonial uh, uh, perspective on anthropology, which really was, which developed basically as a way of, of the of European colonialists understand, uh, you know, getting a handle on how the people they were conquering lived. So that was its origin, and so they turned it on its head, and I, so I got to do that, and so that was something that. So I like that kind of school much better. That was your kind of school. Did you participate in the 1968 demonstration? No, I didn't get to Mexico until 19, well, I went with my family, actually, right after high school. I went, my, my whole family lived for eight months in Mexico. That's how I got connected with Mexico. And we had friends, my, my dad had colleagues, my mother worked at the, at the, at the, at the children's hospital there as a, doing a study about, uh, about malnutrition and the effect on the brain, because she's a neurologist. And um, and I began to go to the university, and I got connected with with people. I fell in love, and so and then I went back to the University of Wisconsin for a semester, and then at at the first winter break, I went back to Mexico. Pres I thought just to spend the winter break there, but I stayed. Wisconsin was a very radical school, but by the time I got there, it was like. <sighs> It had actually deflated very, I mean, it had a terrible experience that you maybe remember. There was, a, a, the, the, the math building was, was blown up by, um, by accident, but it, somebody got killed. And so um, everybody was like kind of, I mean, it just, everything really deflated. I don't know if that was the only reason. Nobody wanted to impeach Nixon. Nobody was, you know, everybody was contemplating their navel by that time. So, so I, uh, you know, just didn't interest me. Mexico continues to be exciting for you. Much, much more. And, uh, yeah, and so then after, you know, in the 90s I came back here and I've lived here ever since. But very involved in the activist community and activist scholar and working with young people in my neighborhood, work doing anti-war, you know, lots and lots and lots of different kinds of stuff and write and writing, a lot of writing, writing fiction, looking at uh, activist culture. So basically I became somebody who's really focused on activist culture, what it is to be an activist and to become an activist, to live as an activist, have the experience of being an activist. You grew up that way, so I guess it, it all stuck in one way or another. And you've written a book called? Rainwood House Sings. A novel. It's a novel. It's a novel about activists. It's a novel where, where activists are the, are the main characters. And um, part, it's, that's part of a project to encourage people to write, to write books fiction that really gets into it, opens windows into the world of activists, because fiction can do that in ways that nonfiction can't always do. Thank you, Julie. So this is the book that I, the, the novel that I was talking about. It's a, it's a, it's called Rainwood House Sings, a social justice mystery about activists involved in Washington, D.C and in a fictional place very in Prince George's County. And um, this is, and both as, this is, this is Richard Barnett, my father's book. You can see we both, we both write thick books, although I also, this is, this is one of the books that I've, that I've worked on with my, with my, uh, the young people in my neighborhood. It's their first novel. It's called Zombie Elementary, about, about, um, um, kids working together with zombies to uh, to learn and to overcome prejudice. So it's the least scary zombie book you're ever going to read. But uh, so, and uh, hope you'll check them out.